Um, and I'm delighted to um, introduce um, Dr. Angela Ralte, who is going to speak today. Um, before we go into the presentation, just a little bit of housekeeping as usual, uh, just to ask people to mute their microphones and also um, their, turn off their videos because that helps with the connection. Um, also, uh, Dr. Ralte has agreed to uh, for us to record this session, so just to be aware of that, and the recording has started already, so um, just so everyone's aware of that, and we will post this up on the BAC um, YouTube site that we have for, for members. Um, the, we will have a time at the end of the presentation for question and answer. So if I could ask people to use the chat now going forward just for questions. So it makes it easier for me to see the questions as they come up and keep a track of the questions. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Angela Ralte. Um, she's originally from uh, Mizoram in northeast India. She earned her MBBS degree from St. John's Medical College, Bangalore, and MD in pathology from the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi, and completed her training for the FRC PATH in Newcastle, UK. She's currently the lead gynecological pathologist for Northern Gynecological Oncology Centre and the lead cytopathologist for Northeastern Yorkshire Cervical Screening Centre in Gateshead. Thank you, Angela, for agreeing to talk to us and really looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, Alison, for your kind introduction. Good afternoon and thank you all for joining me today. And many thanks to the British Association for Cytopathology for this really exciting opportunity to talk to you about the role of intraoperative cytology in the surgical management of tumours of the female genital tract. And could this serve as an alternative to frozen sections? Before I begin, I'd like to take you back real quick to 1920s England during the reign of King George V, a time in history which saw a radical change in the political landscape of Great Britain. This period also saw the beginning of, new, of a new era in cytopathology. Before this time, cytologic diagnosis was viewed with skepticism and regarded as impractical curiosities by most pathologists of the time. However, it was in 1928 that Aurel Babesh and George Papinakalau independently reported that cervical cancers could be diagnosed on vaginal smears, although this went relatively unnoticed until much later. Around the same time, Leonard Dudgeon, professor of pathology at University College London, had observed that perfect preparations of intestinal parasites were obtained when wet films of intestinal mucus were examined using Shorden's fluid. It occurred to him that the same method could be employed for the rapid diagnosis of tumours. He, along with resident surgeon Vincent Patrick, studied 200 consecutive cases of tumours using this technique and published their findings in 1927 in a landmark paper describing this new method for the rapid microscopical diagnosis of tumours. The results of the first 200 cases of intraoperative cytology were very successful when compared with permanent sections, and only six of the 200 cases were definitely serious errors. Intriguingly, this new method, which many considered a critically important contribution to cytopathology, and which even competed with frozen section for intraoperative diagnostic methodological preeminence, did not exactly snowball in popularity at the time. And this is even more interesting, considering the fact that intraoperative frozen section on the whole was considered unreliable owing to the imperfect sections obtained and the short time available for microscopic examination. However, in recent years, especially in the last three to four decades, there has been a resurgence of this technique with several reports demonstrating the accuracy of intraoperative cytology as a complement to frozen section, and in some situations, even as an alternative to frozen section histology in the intraoperative diagnosis of tumors from various sites. 
We have been using intraoperative cytology as an adjunct to frozen section histology for several years now. And when COVID first happened, and we had to suspend our frozen section service due to it being an aerosol generating procedure, we replaced frozen section histology with intraoperative cytology. In an ideal world, one would undertake proper validation with frozen section and permanent sections before taking, which many might consider a rather drastic decision. However, the pandemic created a far from ideal world where laboratories were faced with an unprecedented task of minimizing risk to laboratory staff whilst continuing to provide high quality of care, including intraoperative diagnostic service. And this couldn't be truer for our gynae cancer patients referred to our center, which is the Northern Gynecological Oncology Center based in Gateshead, which is the regional cancer center for gynecological malignancies covering a population of 2.6 million with patients spanning from Whitehaven on the West Coast to Berwick-upon-Tweed at the Scottish borders. A logistical challenge at best of times, but made far worse by fluctuating lockdown restrictions. And this made the need to continue providing an intraoperative diagnostic service even more pressing, as it would allow a one-step procedure with intraoperative diagnosis, rather than a two-step procedure without it for those patients that were subsequently confirmed to be cancer. The most common indication for intraoperative frozen section at our center is for the diagnosis of ovarian tumors to guide the scope and extent of surgery. The other indications are to assess margins in trachelectomy specimens and to assess lymph nodes for metastatic disease, etc. I will start with a radical trachelectomy specimen sent for a surgical margin, which could either be the upper end of the endocervical canal or lower uterine segment or even the endometrium, and more on that later. What is radical trachelectomy? It is a fertility sparing surgery in women with early stage cervix cancer wishing to preserve fertility. The surgery involves removal of the cervix, upper part of the vagina, and connective tissues around the uterus called the parametrium. This surgery is offered to selected patients who are less than 40 years old with early stage cervix cancer measuring less than two centimeters with limited endocervical involvement as evidenced by MRI and uh, colposcopy. The structures removed are the majority of the cervix, parametrium, uterosacral ligament, vaginal cuff and lymph nodes followed by permanent encirclage of the cervical stump. This trachelectomy specimen with a type one cervix where the transformation zone is fully visible to the colposcopist, contains an exophytic tumor at the external os located at quite a distance from the surgical margin you will see as I go on to the subsequent slides. Note that the wide vaginal cuff is character characteristically rugose, which disappears when stretched. Now this is the surgical margin we are looking to assess, and this is the parametrium on either side of the cervix. This is the cut surface showing the tumor at the ecto cervix or rather at the SCJ and appears quite a distance from the surgical margin. The scrape cytology of the surgical margin could represent either the upper limit of the endocervix as I mentioned earlier, lower uterine segment or in some instances even the endometrium. And this can be quite difficult to assess accurately as to where the upper limit is. But suffice to say that benign epithelium, whether it's LUS or um, endocervix or in fact even the endometrium, shows a characteristically uniform appearance. They may be slightly crowded, they lack a honeycomb pattern, but new, the nuclei are uniform, you, even chromatin with smooth nuclear outlines. No mitosis or abnormal chromatin pattern is seen. Oh, sorry, I forgot to mention. And you can see the stromal cells as dark sesame-like nuclei on top of these cell groups. In this case, the scrape cytology was reported as benign, which corresponded with the frozen section histology, which shows widely spaced glands, light by bland, uniform cuboidal 
two columnar epithelium, which supported the benign cytology. Now, this is the whole mount permanent section showing this villoglandular tumor arising from just beyond the squamous columnar junction here. And you wish all glandular lesions were this visible and not tucked up high in the endocervical canal, right? Note, on high power, you can see this exophytic villoglandular tumor, a very subtle high-grade siegen there, and possible high-grade siegen or silver type A endocervical adenocarcinoma. An even high magnification, you can see that this is an endocervical adenocarcinoma, usual type, mixed villoglandular and invasive smile pattern or silver pattern C. Invasive smile is also called stratified mucin producing carcinoma, and it is composed of solid nests of stratified epithelium, which looks like squamous carcinoma on low power, but with this bluish tinge, which represents the intracytoplasmic mucin, as opposed to the pinkish hue of squamous cell carcinoma. Elsewhere, you can see silver type A, pattern of adenocarcinoma, which can often be mistaken for complex high grade C gene. Now, coming back to the ovarian tumors, which I mentioned earlier, is the most common indication for intraoperative frozen section requests. A significant proportion of ovarian tumors present at an advanced stage. There are, however, there are also considerable challenges for the management of early stage disease, as benign and malignant diagnoses may have similar tumor marker profile and radiological appearances. If malignancy is confirmed, staging procedure can be performed at the same time, eliminating the need for a second procedure. Staging surgery includes total hysterectomy, bilateral salpingophorectomy, omentectomy, pelvic and periaortic lymphadenectomy and peritoneal biopsies, where a staging procedure is not only unnecessary, but may also contribute to subsequent mortality and morbidity in metastatic ovarian tumors. In the presence of disseminated disease, frozen section is used to confirm gynecological origin before undertaking radical cytoreductive surgery. These would be for cases where preoperative diagnostic biopsies were not possible or insufficient due to lack of accessible sites for biopsies, or at laparotomy is found to have an unusual disease distribution or odd appearance for gynecological primary. In the early days of the pandemic, we received 10 cases for intraoperative assessment. The decision to carry out intraoperative cytology was taken where preoperative alternatives were not available or considered unsafe. In, those, in these 10 cases, 100% concordance was achieved between intraoperative diagnostic diagnosis and final histology. Now, by concordance, I mean a diagnosis of benign or malignancy and subtyping where possible. All patients diagnosed as malignant underwent the appropriate staging procedure and none of the 10 patients required a second surgery. And the bonus was no one caught COVID during the procedure and the turnaround time was quicker than frozen section histology. I will now share a few illustrative examples of ovarian tumors where intraoperative cytology was used as an alternative frozen to, uh, as an alternative to frozen section histology in the early days of the pandemic. Few examples where it was used as an adjunct to frozen section histology where intraoperative cytology helped resolve diagnostic dilemmas. And I will also include uh, cases um, from our own experience, as well as in literature, which showed the highest rate of discordance between frozen section histology and final histology, and where cytology has actually helped improve diagnostic accuracy. This is the literature review of frozen sections, the largest series to date being from our center by none other than uh, Dr. Paul Cross, my colleague and predecessor. So coming on to the first case, this was, as you can see, from, 90, from January 19, sorry, 20, uh, January 2019. Now, this lady presented the disseminated intraperitoneal malignancy. The surgeon phoned to give us the heads up that she was sending a piece of the amentum as the entire abdominal cavity was carpeted by nodules of tumor. And she said it looked really odd and she had seen nothing like it. And she wanted to know if it was gynae primary, in which case she will need to have an extensive debulk lasting over 12 hours 
or so, and if not, it will have to be an open and closed procedure. We received the specimen, which as you can see, is uniform and fleshy in consistency with little holes giving an almost Swiss cheese appearance. And as Sword's Law would have it, the frozen section histology was suboptimal, which often happens and is a pitfall for frozen frozen section histology, which could be either due to a technical issue or the nature of the tissue itself, especially if the cells are particularly delicate. But freezing artifacts and degeneration is not that uncommon in frozen section histology. It looked malignant, but we already knew that, and we were struggling to characterize it further. The scrape cytology, on the other hand, was beautifully cellular, well-preserved, dispersed cells with this beautiful tigroid background and lymphoglandular bodies with karyorexis. The cells possessed really markedly atypical nuclei, although they were relatively uniformly atypical, eccentric nuclei, coarse chromatin, prominent nucleoli, and I don't know if you can observe a hint of eosinophilic hue to the cytoplasm. High power magnification of the same, showing this beautiful tigroid background, lymphoglandular bodies, karyorectic debris, and this eosinophilic cytoplasm, well, I suppose magenta colored cytoplasm. And we were, these are really typical features of a rhabdomyosarcoma, but rhabdomyosarcomas are rare in adults and they carry a very poor prognosis. On further discussion, we were told that the tumor seemed to emanate from the pelvis and clinically the epicenter was located within the pelvic cavity. After extensive discussion, we arrived at a cautious diagnosis that this may represent sarcomatous component of a carcinosarcoma of likely gynecological origin. The lady then underwent a debulk procedure, which from memory went up to, I think it was at 12 midnight, way over 12 hours. And I will go over the specimens we received. This is the omentum. The whole omentum was caked with this cobblestone-like tumor. The uh, this is a section of the uh, gross image of a spleen with tumor in the hilum and invading the splenic parenchyma. This is the diaphragm, which was again co coated with tumor, which was stripped off. And then the pelvic organs. The pelvic organs were completely occupied or infiltrated by this tumor, but you can see the uterus here with the stretched fallopian tube over the tumor and this is a portion of the large bowel. A further section shows this is the rectum, this is the bivalved pelvic organ, so this is the rectum, oh sorry, rectum, ovary and this tumor occupying the pouch of Douglas. The consistency was same in all the tumors located outside the pelvis. But when we went into the pelvic organs, you could see that apart from this fleshy appearance, you had this granular papillary structures that were very typical of a serous papillary carcinoma. And within the pouch of Douglas, it went from fleshy to these nodular gelatinous polypoidal structures in the pouch of Douglas, as if the tumor was recapitulating a hollow viscous structure within the pouch of Douglas, and that this rhabdomyosarcomatous tumor grew as sarcoma boitreoid within the pouch of Douglas. Note the adjacent typical granular appearance of a serous papillary carcinoma. You, you actually, the tumor was so encasing the pelvic organs that you had to actually prize it open to, to, to look at the structures. Now this is the permanent section showing the sarcoma boitreoids with the polyp covered by this high grade serous epithelium with dense subepithelial zone of a cambium layer composed of these primitive dark cells adjacent to hypocellular areas with edematostroma containing rhabdomyoblasts. Now these were the other areas showing a full house of all variants of rhabdomyosarcoma with these pleomorphic sheets of rhabdomyoblasts with deeply eosinophilic cytoplasm, elongated strap cells, 
and tadpole cells with cross striations, perivascular accentuation, and further section of the papillary areas with the underlying primitive stromal cells. So the final diagnosis was that of a carcinosarcoma with 90% rhabdomyosarcomatous heterologous com component and 10% high grade serous component, likely fallopian tube origin. The surgeon received complete cytoreduction and she received adjuvant chemotherapy. I think it was carbotaxol, which is the typical chemotherapy for gynae malignancies. And interestingly, she is alive and well three years since her surgery with stable low volume peritoneal disease at the last surveillance. And at this point, uh, she is not having any active intervention, but she is being observed three monthly. Now on to our next case, which was our, which is a 20 centimeter complex pelvic mass from a 62 year old lady. This was our first pandemic case. The specimen, as you can see, is examined and under a ventilated hood with appropriate PPE. The specimen is measured and capsule assessed for disruption, deposits and adhesions. The specimen is serially sliced within a container in order to catch any cyst fluid contents, which can be quite challenging when examining large specimens like this one. The cut surface, as you can see, is solid and cystic with hemorrhagic contents. The solid areas are soft and fleshy with a um, spongy, slightly spongy appearance, but mixed with these bulbous papillary areas, which were selected for scrape cytology. Now, depending on the texture and consistency of the surface to be sampled for cytology, you can use various methods from scrape to touch imprints, which could either be soft or firm, firm touch imprints, and a combination sometimes called the scrimp method, standing for scrape and touch imprint. After blotting away excess fluid and blood, cytology sample was obtained by pressing the edge of a glass slide gently onto the freshly cut surface and scraping the surface with the edge of the glass slide. This was then smeared gently onto the surface of another clean slide. Smears thus prepared are air dried in diff quick solution, fixative solution A, which is contained within this mini wheelie bin. This is followed by staining with diff quick solutions B and C for about 10 to 15 seconds each, blotting out excess fluid between each step. And like Dutch and all those years ago, the only additional material needed for this procedure can then fit into a small portable case with the whole procedure taking no longer than two to three minutes and performed entirely by the pathologist. Now, this is the tumor once we've removed all the hemorrhagic contents. Grossly malignant with the differential diagnosis between the two tumors associated with endometriosis, namely clear cell carcinoma and endometrioid adenocarcinoma. In this instance, I would favor clear cell carcinoma grossly as the papillary extrasenses are quite bulbous, similar to that of the tops of chlorophyll florids. This is the diff quick stained scrape cytology showing loose cohesive cells with these abundant fragile cytoplasm, either finely granular or finely vacuolated, small to medium sized nuclei with minimal pleomorphism, along with these deep magenta colored highlight stromal cores. This reminds me a bit of, of a cynic cell carcinoma, if you like. And based on these features, an intraoperative diagnosis of clear cell carcinoma was made, which was confirmed on permanent sections, and the patient underwent staging procedure at the same time. The next case is slightly different. It is a solid ovarian mass, again from a postmenopausal lady with a slightly raised CA125 showing fibromatous, spongy, and edematous areas with grape like vesicles, almost resembling a hydropic uh, chorionic villi. Oh, I actually want to just mention. And some of the changes can be quite subtle, but better appreciated on a fixed specimen. On higher magnification, you can observe this um, trabeculated, almost spongy appearance, and there is this abrupt transition to this more solid areas and to these vesicular areas. Two sections were taken from the fibrotic and spongy area. Um, I avoided sampling the vesicular areas for frozen section histology as they were unlikely to cryosection properly, but I used the scrape method to obtain cytology from these firm areas and a soft touch imprint to obtain cells from these loose vesicular areas. 
On the left is a frozen section histology with the corresponding permanent section. On the right, note the fibromatous stroma containing these scattered, widely spaced glands and cysts lined by a single layer of benign looking epithelium, which is either attenuated or cuboidal with small bland nuclei and pale cytoplasm. The scraped cytology from the fibromatous areas showed flat honeycombed monolayered sheets, orderly benign looking cells, and the cytology from the spongy and vesicular areas showed loss of the orderly honeycomb pattern with more variation in nuclear size and hyperchromasia, a bit like a, a drunken honeycomb if you like, but still quite monotonous. Note the subtle, I don't know if you can see it, subtle magenta colored highline eosinophilic globules. The nuclear cytoplasmic ratio is maintained and cytoplasm is dense in some areas, but on the whole, the cells possessed abundant, fragile, finely granular to wispy cytoplasm, again, quite similar to an SNH cell carcinoma. An, intra oh, sorry, an intraoperative diagnosis of benign areas admixed with areas that may represent clear cell carcinoma or even a borderline clear cell tumor was made. The patient underwent staging procedure, which included total hysterectomy, bilateral cell thrombophorectomy, omentectomy, pelvic and parioretic lymphadenectomy. Interestingly, the final stage was stage 1A. Now, this is the final histology showing the tumoral heterogeneity. Now, this low power view shows the adenofibromatous area merging into the borderline and into the clear cell carcinoma areas, most likely the tubo tubulocystic subtype. Now, close to the heterogeneity, though not well represented in the frozen section because we are limited by the number of sections we can take, was actually revealed by the cytology due to the ability to sample from a wider area. This is the corresponding cytology and the areas of clear cell carcinoma. Immunohistochemistry is not usually required to make a diagnosis of because the appearances can be quite typical, but we usually use a panel of Amica, Asian F1 beta, and Napsin, I think Napsin was negative in this. We use three markers because not all three can be positive. And these were, what was interesting was the benign areas were positive for ER, estrogen receptor and negative for progesterone receptor. They were negative for WT1, which is a marker for serous carcinoma. And the P53 shows a wild type reaction pattern. Now, this is a well-known area, difficult area of ovarian tumor frozen section interpretation, especially tumors that developed from clear cell adenofibroma, probably via the arid one a pic 3 ca mutation, similar to, that, to, similar to that seen in endometriosis, but without the clues provided by endometriosis on gross examination. The next case is an 18 centimeter solid cystic mass from another postmenopausal woman with a slightly raised CA125. Again, the capsule is examined for deposits, disruptions, and adhesions. This is largely intact, but you can see that there is a focal area of capsular disruption and adhesions. Slicing revealed two distinct components, one showing the strabeculated microcystic appearance composed of these numerous small, thin, and slightly thick wall cysts containing mucoid material. Note that the, structural, the structure and integrity of the cyst is retained without flopping and collapsing when the cyst contents are released. The other component is smooth, homogeneous, slightly tan, very soft in consistency. And if you were to do a touch test like you do for steak, this would be the consistency of soft cheeks. Two sections were taken for section histology, one from the solid and one from the trabeculated microcystic areas and scrape cytology was obtained from both components. The microcystic trabeculated area shows these irregular dilated glands with containing bluish tinged mucoid material within the dilated lumina. As you can see, the glands are lined by a single layer of benign looking, either low cuboidal or columnar epithelium with dark but bland non-stratified non nuclei. The solid component shows cells that are loosely arranged in sheets, quite fragile looking, but little supporting stroma. The stroma where present is loose and edematous. Now coming to the cytology. Again, fragile looking cells, 
finely vacuolated cytoplasm, moderate amounts of fragile cytoplasm, round hypochromatic nuclei with relatively uniform nuclear size and shape. There is a bit of mucin in the background and a few stromal hyaline structures. And based on these features, a diagnosis of clear cell carcinoma cannot exclude mucinous comp component was made. The patient underwent staging procedure with the final stage of 1C2, and these are the permanent sections. The permanent sections of the microcystic component show cystically dilated glands containing mucin. The nuclear atypia is seen is better seen on high power magnification, and which I hope you agree with me shows typical features of a clear cell carcinoma. You can see these cuboidal epithelium with prominent uh, hypochromatic nuclei, clear cytoplasm and nuclear hop nailing, and there is a early invasion in this section. <clears throat> this is the Alcyon blue DPS stain highlighting <clears throat> the presence of intraluminal ovarian tumors, including serous, clear cell, and endometrioid. This is the solid component on high power, which shows abundant clear cytoplasm with distinct cytoplasmic margins and mildly hyperchromatic nuclei. Mitotic activity is scanty and nuclear atypia is moderate at most. Again, immunostochemistry is not required, but we usually use this panel. And in this tumor, it is positive for HNF1 beta, napsin, and shows wild type positivity for P53. Right, I'm wondering whether to just rush over this. This is just another example of a clear cell carcinoma, and this time the tumor is cystic with these bulbous intracystic polypoidal projections with gelatinous areas and this vesicular character to the tops of, the, of some of the papillae. The frozen section histology showed these ribbons, glands, and papillae lined by relatively monotonous looking cells that are medium-sized with eosinophilic cytoplasm, uniformly mild nuclear atypia, and pale hyaline stroma. The nuclei are round and hypochromatic with small um, distinct nuclei in areas. The scrape cytology is most beautiful in this case. It shows the classical features of clear cell carcinoma, which you must be familiar with by now, with these papillary clusters and loosely cohesive groups with abundant, moderate to abundant fragile cytoplasm and beautifully, beautiful magenta colored highline stromal cores. The permanent sections show a tubulo papillary pattern of clear cell carcinoma with these hyalinized papillary cores which were beautifully seen on the cytology preparation as dense highline magenta stroma, which was difficult to recognize on frozen section histology. And this tumor was positive for HNF1 beta and napsin. I have thus attempted to demonstrate the range of gross appearances of a clear cell carcinoma, a tumor with the highest rates of discordance between intraoperative and final diagnosis. And those arising from an adenofibroma may appear grossly benign and cytology is invaluable in these situations. Frozen section interpretation of clear cell carcinoma can be difficult as the typical features of clear cell carcinoma that are easily recognized on permanent sections are really artifacts of fixation and are therefore not obvious on frozen section histology like the clear cytoplasm. Stromal hyaline cores again that are so characteristic on permanent sections can appear rather pale and unremarkable on frozen section histology. However, if you combine the clinical features of marginally raised C125, large bosylated ovarian masses, associated endometriosis on gross examination, combined with the typical cytological features of magenta highlight stroma, small round nuclei, minimal nuclear pleomorphism, and abundant, fragile, finely granular or finely vacuolated cytoplasm it becomes a slam dunk diagnosis. And what I find uh, most fascinating is that the cytological features are similar, irrespective of the gross appearance and the histologic subtype. Now on to our next set of cases. 
again, 50 year old, large ovarian mass, marginally raised C125. And this is an intact smooth wall cyst that I would call a happy cyst. There are no adhesions or disruptions to the capsule and it appears to be a tumor that has grown slowly over a period of time. Now, current recommendation is to take about two sections per centimeter, but obviously this is not practical in, a in an intraoperative situation. Therefore, to maximize, maximize the chances of targeting the most significant area, I normally just palpate the cyst and feel for any firm or hard areas and choose those areas to make the first slice. On opening, you can see that the cyst is multilocalated, thin-walled with this watery mucoid fluid and the cyst flops and collapses as the mucinous contents are released. I then run my hand over the cut surface and feel for any solid or firm areas which will be selected for sampling. Frozen section, histology of the most complex area shows glands and dilated cysts, again lined by this rather uniform, minimally stratified epithelium that are basally located. The scrape cytology, shows uniform, monolayered, but slightly crowded groups with no evidence of significant nuclear atypia. And based on the gross frozen section histology and intraoperative cytology, an intraoperative diagnosis of a mucinous tumor borderline at most was made. This is the fixed section to compare with the fresh one seen earlier. <clears throat> Excuse me, the permanent sections reflected the frozen section histology. Extensive sampling did not reveal any worse areas than were sampled for frozen section histology. And in fact, this area, which was the area sample for frozen section was the most complex area even after extensive sampling. So the final diagnosis was that of a mucinous borderline tumor. The next case is another large mass with a slightly raised, well, well sl slightly more than, um, the normal CA125 is about 34, so this is markedly raised CA125. This is what I would call an unhappy cyst. The cyst capsule is largely intact, but it has an area of yellowish discoloration, most likely an infarct, and there is a, a small area of capsular disruption with mucoid material oozing from this defect. And this has already provided us a hint to make a concerted effort to look for any solid areas. On slicing, again, this is a multilocalated, mostly thin walled with thin mucoid fluid, but with a bit more variegation than the previous cyst. And as I run my hand over the cut surface, I can feel a small firm area measuring about 2.5 centimeters. And this area was pre preferentially sampled for frozen section histology and intraoperative cytology. Now, even at this low power, this is the frozen section histology, you can appreciate the architectural complexity with marked epithelial proliferation seen better on higher magnification, but you also can appreciate the back-to-back -back confluent glands with stromal exclusion. The epithelium lining the glands show marked nuclear atypia with goblet cells and luminal necrosis. Scraped cytology from the thin-walled areas shows honeycomb sheets of uniform monolayered benign epithelium as expected, but the cytology from the firm areas showed crowded, loose and discohesive groups of markedly atypical cells with clear-cut nuclear features of malignancy. Thus, an intraoperative diagnosis of at least mucinous borderline tumor with a small area of adenocarcinoma was made, we were unable to comment if the invasion was of exp expansile or infiltrative type and the patient underwent staging procedure with the final stage of 1C2. The permanent section of the thin walled portions showed this predominantly benign looking cyst lined by bland mucinous epithelium. The solid sample area sampled for frozen section showed these complex atypical glands with frequent mitosis and, ne and luminal necrosis, confirming an adenocarcinoma. Now on to our next case, which is slightly different in that she has a number of tumor markers that were raised and there was no evidence of extra ovarian disease. Clinically, she was a stage 1A and 
thought to be a primary ovarian neoplasm, and frozen protection was requested to confirm and proceed with debulking or staging procedure. We were informed that the pelvic mass was awed and there was a small omental nodule which hadn't been picked up on imaging. You can see that this is a solid multi-lobulated mass. The capsule was intact, but there was a glistening tumor deposit on the capsular surface. The cut surface was mostly solid with the central cystic area, glistening and gelatinous, almost transparent, and almost reminds me of a pumpkin sweet. The, this is the fixed image showing to show you the difference between the fresh, fresh and the fixed image. The straight cytology shows abundant mucin with scattered naked hypochromatic nuclei with cytological features of malignancy. I don't know whether you can appreciate that. They were very scant. This was one of the um, pandemic cases, so it did not have frozen section histology, and we made a diagnosis of pseudomyxoma peritonei, uh, sorry, pseudomyxoma ovarii, favoring metastasis, possibly appendiceal origin. And it is a characteristic of the mucus that, that, that gave us that impression, also supported by the surgeon saying that the appendix looked a bit abnormal. This is the appendix, which was bulbous and indurated. The cut surface was small, multiloculated cysts, and the permanent sections showed abundant extracellular mucin dissecting these fibrous tissues, and that may explain why we did not really get more cellularity as it was mainly mucin that was dissecting the tissues. But on higher power and mostly within the appendix, the tumor showed these signet ring cells and the section of the appendix showed transmural involvement by this tumor, which was positive for the markers typical of grade three goblet cell adenocarcinoma of primary appendiceal origin involving full thickness appendix. She did not undergo a full debulk procedure. It was just the removal of the appendix and the omentum. This is another case, uh, a non a pre pandemic case um, from a 45 year old lady. The MRI showed a lobulated solid mass filling the pelvic cavity with bowel with, um, which was draped around the bowel and they were finding it difficult to determine the epicenter as neither ovary was separately vi visualized. Um, and the surgeon rang me to say, we didn't know what it was because there was nothing on the request form. This was following a phone call later. And uh, it was one of my colleagues that did this, uh, the, the, that did the first stage of the frozen section. And it was just, what appeared to be edematous fibrous tissue. And uh, with frozen sections, we normally get a second opinion on difficult cases. So this was sent to requested as a second opinion. And I thought there's no way I can make a diagnosis on this. It just looks like mush. I've got no idea what's going on. Decided to do a touch implant cytology. And as you scrape the slide over the tissue, you can just see the mucus being sliding onto the surface. And the moment you put it in GEMSA, it just turns blue. And this is a slam dunk mucinous tumor. And when you see closely, you can see the signet ring cells that I've encircled here, which actually, when you go back, you can see it in the original frozen section, but there is so much of background noise that it is hard to pick out the signet ring cells because they're so intermingled with, with, with fibrous tissue. So oftentimes, Metastatic signet ring carcinomas are just, you know, interpreted as edematous fibrous tissue, but actually we've managed to give a diagnosis of metastatic mucinous carcinoma with signet ring cells, and that was all the specimens we received as it was an open and closed procedure, and unfortunately this lady died within six months of diagnosis. I don't know how much time we have left, um, but I will just quickly go over this case which is from um, I'm just wondering which I think it was from 20 20 um, 2018 I think let me just yeah 2018 so um, just solid spongy mass 
it was nothing like I'd seen before. It looked a bit like clear cell, but it just wasn't right for a clear cell fibromatous. It just felt more rubbery. Didn't know what it was. C125 was marginally raised, and yeah, it was 2018. And this is the fixed section. This is the frozen section showing an obvious adenocarcinoma, but which did not neatly fit into any of the categories that we, we, we are used to. So it didn't look like serous, it didn't look like endometrioid, didn't know what it was. And this is the cytology, which showed these, you know, crowded groups with very dis distinct community border and binucleate cells with this face-to-face -face or, or sort of face-to-face -face appearance or mirror image, if you like. Um, still didn't know what it was. We just called it non-mucinous gland-forming adenocarcinoma, favoring gynae origin, likely high grade, but unable to accurately subtype. And the patient underwent a staging procedure. And these are the sections of the permanent sections of the tumor showing a markedly heterogeneous tumor in terms of architecture. But these were positive for TTF1, GATA3, and flat negative for ER with the wild type P53 reaction pattern, negative for calretinin and CD10. And at the time, we did not make this diagnosis of a um, mesonephric like adenocarcinoma. It's a new emerging entity that's only been described in the WHO 2020 um, edition. And this tumor was subsequently sent for KRAS mutation, which showed typical mutation at codon 12. The tumor invaded all these structures and um, she recurred in February 2021 in the vaginal stump and unfortunately with lung metas metastasis. The problem with this tumor is it has been called all sorts before it, ha it, it, it you know, before we started recognizing them as, as being high grade, they were called low grade serous because of P53 wild type. And in some instances they are called endometrioid because they look like endometrioid and you know, they've been called all sorts, but now we're able to recognize them a bit better. Um, I don't know if the cytological features are entirely typical for this tumor because I've not seen quite enough. I've seen about three, I've done about three to four interruptive cytology on these cases, but none of them are distinctive enough to have a, you know, a clear cut. Yeah, this is a, um, this is a mesonephric like adenocarcinoma. It's still early days, but hopefully with practice and seeing more cases, we'll be able to um, offer a more accurate diagnosis. This is, uh, do you know, sorry, how much time do I have left? I'm just aware of the time. I'm just going to- Yeah, we're on 20, Angela, we're on 20 past two. I have no questions in the chat as yet. All right. Um, okay. So if you want another five minutes and then that'll allow people to put questions in, is that yeah. okay? Yeah, that's fine. This was a uh, disseminate. Okay, this lady had an acidic fluid that we had diagnosed as containing serous carcinoma. But when the surgeon went in, he said, well, it's, it just looks like a small dermoid cyst. And this, you know, there's really nothing in the tubes and ovaries that he could see. Could you please, you know, was it, was the acidic fluid correct diagnosis? And when he opened, yes, it did look like a mature cystic teratoma. But when I looked closely at the fallopian tube, it had this bulbous appearance to the fimbrial end. And you can see this is this fleshy tube. And on cytology, it shows classical features of a high-grade serous papillary carcinoma. And the, high, and the diagnosis of high-grade serous papillary carcinoma, fallopian tube origin was made. And the important thing here is sometimes the ovary can look abnormal and to just ensure that the fallopian tube is examined. It might not present as an obvious mass, but sometimes these tumors can even have metastasis within the supraclavicular node without actually forming a large mass within the pelvic cavity. This is one of the pandemic cases, solid cystic mass in a postmenopausal lady and tissue from, for cytology was obtained from this solid papillary areas and it shows beautiful features of 
honeycomb benign appearing sheets and a diagnosis of a benign papillary cirrhosis adenofibroma was made. This is almost akin to a, a fibroadenoma. And what's interesting is there's very little epithelium on the histology, but the beautiful cytological preparations that these tumors generate is quite, quite interesting. So now to conclude, it is not always possible to subtype the tumor, but accurate subtyping is really not crucial for intraoperative management. And very occasionally, it might not even be possible to give a broad diagnostic category. But as Dudgeon st stated in his paper, it is difficult to believe that by any rapid method, some errors will not occur when we consider that microscopy of some new growths requires long periods of exhaustive examination. The advantages of intraoperative cytology is that they're easy compared to perform compared to frozen section. They require less technical expertise and are less dependent on the availability of experienced lab staff. They offer the pathologist an additional method with which to visualize cells, cells that are well-preserved with superior nuclear details without the freezing artifacts using time-honored cytological features of benignity and malignancy. It requires no additional time and I usually interpret the cytology slides while awaiting for the frozen section histology and it requires minimal additional lab resources in terms of equipment and personnel and is an excellent complement to frozen section histology. Over the years, several comparative studies have been published comparing the diagnostic accuracy of both techniques with some papers favoring cytology over frozen section and others the other way around. An elegant study conducted by Mayer and I think it's the Mount Sinai Medical Center used a quantitative, semi-quantitative point scoring system in studying the diagnostic accuracy and quality of specimens obtained in a series of 206 consecutive cases from all sites. And the major conclusion of this study was that the quality of cytologic preparations was significantly, um, significantly superior to that of frozen sections, but the accuracy of diagnosis by the two techniques was not significantly different. Their results showed that cytology and frozen section histology are complementary rather than competitive methods, and when used together, offer the greatest opportunity for correct intraoperative diagnosis. I will wholeheartedly echo the statement as reflected in our own experience. Thus, the authors conclude that because cytology neither adds significantly to the time needed for frozen section preparation, nor impose additional demands to the lab, the authors advocate the simultaneous use of both frozen section histology and cytology in the intraoperative evaluation of surgical specimens. And I would strongly endorse this statement and perhaps go one step further to say that in many situations, intraoperative cytology can replace rather than merely complement frozen section histology like it did for us in the early days of the pandemic. It is useful in low resource settings or where there are no facilities for frozen section or when one receives multiple specimens from the same patient, usually multiple lymph nodes. Intraoperative cytology leaves, provides reliable diagnosis while leaving tissues available for further studies, including not just permanent sections, but ancillary molecular studies, etc. The limitations are that we are unable to assess invasion, especially in borderline cases, but this is also an issue with frozen section histology. And mainly, I think the limitation is the lack of experience as it is currently underused due to lack of pathologist experience. I think not only that, I think it can help bridge the widening gap between histopathology and cytopathology. And as crucially important as new molecular techniques are, I feel that we are in imminent danger of having them outstrip our gross diagnostic and morphological observational skills, especially for our new generation pathologists. The cytology slides can also form a useful educational resource that could be archived in cytology slide teaching cells. 
and cells that are obtained are rich in high quality tumor cell nuclei for the ever increasing ancillary molecular tests, particularly since these lack the nuclear truncation artifacts seen with histological sections. It has also been shown to provide tumor enriched samples that are an excel excellent source of high quality tumor DNA for cell culture studies. And most of all, like all cytology, it is simple, accurate, fast, and economical. And thank you for your attention. This, I took this picture yesterday of yesterday's sunset. It was absolutely gorgeous. So I thought I'd like to share that with you as well. And I don't know if there are any questions, but I'm happy to take any if we have time. Thank you. Hi, Angela. Yeah, with a few questions there, but I'd like to thank you for a very interesting um, talk and some beautiful pictures and images there. So thank you. It was really, really good. A um, number of questions then that have come in. There's a couple in relation to, um, I suppose, the diagnosis of different um, um, tumour types. So immature, can you use it to um, manage cases like immature teratoma? And also, can you tell serous cystadenoma versus cystadenofibroma? Um, okay, so the first question, can you, uh, cystadenoma versus cystadenofibroma, they're both benign, so you can't, it doesn't matter whether you call it cystadenoma or fibroma because the management would be the same and the patient would not have a staging procedure. And it, I don't think you can hand on heart say whether it's an adenofibroma or an adenoma. Usually, grossly, the cystadenoma don't have a fibrous, you know, it, they don't have a fibrous thickening, it's a simple cyst. The cyst adenofibroma, like the image I showed, it almost looks like a fibroadenoma of the breast, so you can usually tell grossly, but on cytology, not really, and it doesn't really matter because they're both benign. Okay. Sorry, I missed the other question. The other one was then, um, how would you manage cases like immature teratoma? Right, immature teratoma is difficult. Germ cell tumors are difficult, and we don't encourage the surgeons to do frozen sections in really young women because the stakes are really high and they usually want to preserve fertility. So we avoid doing frozen sections on them because of the limited number of tissues that we can sample. And also invariably these women would like a definite diagnosis because they would like to preserve fertility. Immature teratoma, very difficult. Um, we have done mature cystic teratomas, but if it's a, if there are solid areas and if the areas that are a bit worrying, we defer to paraffin. Okay, very good. Um, can you check for metastases in lymph nodes as well yes. by imprint cytology? Yeah. Yeah. So it's, so the method I use for lymph nodes is, is different. Normally the lymph nodes, we section them perpendicular to the long axis, but for frozen section, we slice them parallel to the long axis and rather than scrape the surface, you touch the cut surface of the lymph node onto the slide. So that's a slightly different method. And yes, we do occasionally get that for sentinel nodes. Okay, I don't know if you've answered this, my, my audio went off slightly, but um, if intraoperative cytology does not affect surgical management, why do it? It does affect us. It does right. affect the difficult management big time, because as I mentioned, and illustrated the 10 cases during the early days of the pandemic, especially when we did not know the COVID status of the patients and the, um, the false negative rates were quite high. We did intraoperative cytology on 10 cases and all 10 were showed 100% concordance. So yes, it does significantly affect surgical management, most definitely. And our surgeons have bought into that as well, because at the start, it was either something or nothing. So we were cautiously optimistic when we decided on doing this, because the advice from the RCPATH and the G BAGP came out on March 23rd. I know the exact date and time, because it was a Friday evening, and we had three cases listed for frozen section on a Monday. So we had to make decisions fairly quickly, and they were happy to take whatever we gave them, but with no guarantees. And they were quite happy that, you know, they will take whatever we gave them, really. And it turned out well in the end because a lot of these patients did not need to come back for a second procedure. Okay, and actually, you probably answered this in that one, but but have all your clinical colleagues accepted the technique? 
And my question would be, are you, con are you going to continue with this? Yes. Uh, so my clinical colleagues are mainly gynae oncologists. So um, yes, they've absolutely, you know, bought into it. And they're very happy with the fact that we're able to provide more accurate diagnosis. And personally, for me, the most mistakes I've made have been clear cell carcinoma that I've called benign and that turned out to be malignant. Um, and also for mucinous tumors where, you know, when you don't, when it's a very focal area of carcinoma, it's just doing the gross examination and, and the cytology gives you that much more confidence to call it malignant. And I think using it as an adjunct to frozen section is the way forward rather than being competing methods. I think using them as a complement to each other really helps improve diagnostic accuracy. Okay, and that's answered my second question, whether it would be instead of or as a complementary uh, technique. There's just two, sorry. Uh, sorry, um, I think it can be used as an alternative in some situations, particularly where there are no facilities for frozen section histology. Yeah. And as it did in the pandemic, in the early days of the pandemic for us. And I think in, in, in low and middle income countries, this will save huge costs on theatre time, on patient recovery without having to have a second surgery. So I think we can, accurate subtyping may not be possible, but I think, you know, the, the features of benignity and malignancy are quite useful and quite straightforward on cytology. And I think it can really help in low to middle income countries where frozen section histology is not available. Brilliant. And another question is, that um, have you had feedback from trainees as to whether this has helped them with cytology overall? So um, the, the problem with frozen section is, especially during the pandemic, some trainees were, um, some trainees were shielding and there's, you know, there was a lot of anxiety around fresh tissues at the time. Um, I haven't actually had a formal feedback, but they found it quite interesting because we sit around a multi-header and we go over the slides. So I think it, it exposes them more to cytology. And it also sort of, as I said, it bridges the gap between histology and cytology, because sometimes I find that, you know, they're like two divorced, but actually we're looking at cells. You are just from the same area. It's just a different way of looking at them. But I think, you know, the more we bridge that gap, the better our morphological diagnosis, be it cytology or histology. That's it. And actually, that was in context in the question was that cytology is an integral part of cellular pathology in itself. I think I find one last question, which is technical. Uh, did you use a rapid pap stain in addition to diff quick? No. Or was it just the diff quick? Just yeah. the diff quick, yes. Yeah. That's brilliant. And then I think everything else then is just comments on a great presentation and thank, so thank you very much on that thank really you it's been a pleasure thank you time. have a lovely evening bye-bye thank you